It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Olivia Cremieri, all the way from Switzerland. Give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Olivia. Olivia. Olivia uh, is the co-founder of Bugbuster Incorporated. Uh, and this is going to be one of the highlights of the show, so wa watch out for this. Uh, this is a session on automated testing. Uh, and he's just going to walk you through the product that he's built for it and uh, show you some cool tricks that you can do with it. I'd like to thank uh, Swissnex for bringing him down from Switzerland and Bangor's AS, so Barbara and Jonathan May for getting us in touch with him. Uh, he's already done one great workshop yesterday and uh, uh, you're, you're about to see what, uh, what he's built. Uh, over to you, Olivier. Thank you very much. Thanks for the intro. And thanks for having me here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in India and see this uh, thriving community. Um, um, as, um, as you said, I'm a co-founder of Bugbuster. Um, I've been working uh, with the web and with JavaScript for a long time now. And um, a few years ago, I decided that I was actually sick of JavaScript. So I was like, OK, let's do something else. Let's do a PhD, some serious things. And obviously, it worked very well, because you know, here I am at the JavaScript conference speaking. So anyway, I did um, research in software testing, and um, it ended up um, in the creation of Backbuster, which is a, a startup based at, um, in Lausanne, Switzerland. And um, uh, we're in, we are a spin-off of the school where I, uh, I made my PhD. And our goal is to help you guys build better applications. And for, for that, you need tools uh, that will basically reduce the effort of, uh, of testing these applications and increase the coverage so that you can produce the quality applications that your users expect. Um, so back to the title of my, of my talk, Generating Tests from Code. Uh, actually, yesterday's talk was uh, automating automated tests, and well, it's pretty much this, the, the same idea. So if I talk about automated testing, and I, and I give you the definition, actually, this is from, from Wikipedia. Automated testing is about controlling uh, the execution and the outcome of the test automatically. Obviously, this is much better than doing everything manually, right? So let's, let's look a little bit more about you know, what this means. Um, you're going to use tools like Selenium WebDriver if you're, if you're doing front-end development, or JustMine if you're doing front-end or back-end development for JavaScript. And in practice, what you're going to do is you're going to start by writing one or more test cases. A test case is a piece of code, it's a script, that explains basically uh, what your code is supposed to do and you know, what are the expectations, right? Then you're going to run the tests. Um, hopefully, you're going to find some bugs, so you're going to debug your application. Um, and then, you know, once you, have, once you have no more bugs in your application, you're going to release your program. Um, you know, everything's going to work nicely, you're going to be happy, and you know, you're going you're gonna to be able to go do something else. And then when you write new, new code, you have a new version of your application, you have a new commit, well, you basically start the cycle again, writing more tests, running more tests, and so on and so forth. Well, that's all very nice, but the thing is, if you look at your program, this is sort of a graph uh, showing the control flow of your program with the if statements you know, leading to different blocks of code. It's actually going to be very, very big. Right? Most non-trivial programs are going to have a huge control flow graph. Sometimes it's actually infinite. And when you write a test case, what you're doing is you're essentially uh, encoding the expectation for one path, right? Um, and then if you're lucky, that path will lead to a bug, and you're going to have, uh, you know, uh, you're going to be able to debug the program. But if you're not so lucky, well, maybe you should have written another test case because bugs were somewhere else, and then, uh, you know, you'll be, you'll be missing some, some problems. So if you look at how automated testing really looks in practice, I mean, in, for, in, in real life, well, you write your test cases, then you run the tests, then you debug your tests, because tests are actually more code, right? Then you debug your app, then you release, and then what? You fix the bugs that were reported by your users, right? And well, because you be, were basically caught with your pants down, you don't want this to happen again, so you write additional test cases, right? And then you repeat the cycle for every new version or every new commit, right? So that's exhausting. Um, and that's why, you know, testing has this reputation of being so tedious. Uh, our goal at Backbuster is to basically help you uh, do better than that. So uh, how can, you, can we test better or faster? First idea, use static analysis. Uh, 
We've all dreamt of having a great ID who will basically underline your code as you type it and basically t tell you where the bugs are, right? So static analysis is the technique where you basically analyze the source code without executing it. And well, one could imagine that with such technology you would be able to do that and, you know, and find the bugs before you actually run your code. Right? Um, in JavaScript, there are uh, already some very cool static analysis tools like, you know, JSHint or JSLint. If you're not using them, you should definitely, definitely do that. They'll, you know, tell, tell you about a lot of errors, parse, uh, um, syntax error and that kind of stuff. There are other tools that use static analysis like uh, Clojure or Uglify.js for, for different purpose for basically compiling or minifying your code. Um, well, that's all, uh, that's all very good and useful, but the problem is that static analysis is inherently imprecise. Especially for JavaScript, which is a very dynamic language, it's very hard to know what your code is going to do without executing it. If I just take that st statement here, if uh, foo is greater than zero, and I want to analyze it to make sure it's correct and there is no bug, well, I have to figure out what type, uh, what type foo can be. Could be anything, a string, a number, a function. Um, then I have to figure out where foo is pointing to so that I can basically have an idea of what value it can take. And then I have to figure out what this statement is supposed to do in the first place, right? So I can make assumptions, assumptions about all of that, but it's going to be difficult to be very precise. Uh, it's been done with other languages. It's used in other type of industries. Uh, in the aeronautics industry, for instance, it's used a lot. But for JavaScript, it's extremely difficult. Um, basically, all these imprecisions are going to lead to false positives. Uh, and these false positives are going to slow you down when you debug, and so it, it becomes really difficult to have something uh, really efficient. Um, so what can you do uh, if static analysis isn't enough? Well, we can do dynamic analysis. The idea with dynamic analysis is basically the, the, the reverse of static analysis. The idea is to analyze the code while it runs, instead of uh, um, just you know, looking at it and, and thinking about it. And you're probably already using a lot of dynamic analysis tools, right? A, a debugger is basically using dynamic analysis to step through the code and inspect the code and so on. You have profilers. You have uh, various types of checkers. Actually, I've seen that Microsoft has a stand uh, and they're showing modern.ie. I think they're using um, dynamic analysis to figure out, for instance, if you're using uh, APIs that are unsafe or not compatible across browsers and so on and so forth. So since we're able to basically do all this analysis at runtime, um, here's an idea. What if when we run a, uh, a test case, uh, what if we could actually record the path um, precisely and use that information to basically f uh, come up with other type of inputs that will uh, lead the program down to different paths? Well, that's actually uh, an idea that's been around for a long time, which is called uh, symbolic execution. I think it was f first formulated in the 70s. And it's been a very hot topic in research in the last few years because we now have the, the computing power and the algorithms uh, that we can implement to, to make it work. So symbolic execution can be used to generate test cases. Uh, Microsoft, uh, for instance, is using it to test, uh, I think, uh, Windows. They, they found a lot of bugs uh, in the file system, for instance. NASA is using it. Uh, but these are all prototypes for C, C++, and, and Java. Um, we at Bugbuster are uh, building an implementation for JavaScript. So how does symbolic execution work? Uh, I'm going to give you an example, but this is basically the principle. Uh, symbolic execution starts by recording all the constraints and inputs while you execute your program. So if you're processing input in one way or another, we record everything that, that, that's going on and we formulate that as a mathematical equation. Then when you have a branch, an if statement in your program, we basically record the outcome of the branch, whether you know, it, it went to the true side of the statement or the, uh, the, the false side, and we record the constraint associated uh, with that statement. We then solve that um, to come up with different inputs and then we use this different input to rerun the program, but uh, this time down the different path. So let's go over an example. I have here a simple uh, JavaScript function to validate an email. So what it does is it takes the, 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 the input is a string, an email address, uh, hopefully. 
uh, it trims the, the white space from the email address, then it uses a regular expression to, uh, to see if the syntax of the email address is correct. Right? So how is symbolic execution going to handle that? Well, first it will run this function with uh, arbitrary inputs. Let's say just the string A. Then, well, for each line, it analyzes what's going on. So the, at line two, I'm, uh, the code is trimming the white spaces. So it's recording that email is not, not uh, just the variable anymore. It's, uh, it's now email that trim. And then next line, you have, a, you have an if statement. And that if statement is, uh, is looking at the, your input value. And so we're recording a constraint uh, that basically says, OK, I went to the, to the, to the false side of the branch. So my expression was false. And that's what I record. Then I, I basically pick that expression because I want to uh, craft an email address that is actually valid. So I, I take my expression, I feed that to a solver, and the solver is basically going to come up with another, uh, another input string uh, for my program. So that I, ca I can then rerun um, the program with a valid uh, email address. And that's how I basically uh, cover the two paths of that uh, simple statement. So what is this good for? Uh, first, it's actually very useful to understand your own codes. So we as developers, when we write code, we generally have an idea of how it works and how it should work. But sometimes, and actually very often, we write things that are capable of doing things that we have no idea. And by using that kind of techniques, we can discover these other behaviors before our users do. And that's pretty useful. Um, so from there, we can generate uh, or complete our test suits, which is already, uh, which is also very useful. And we can also use uh, use that as a refactoring tool to compare the behaviors of uh, of two functions. Uh, so we are very happy to uh, to introduce today Unite. Unite is a new it's a new toy actually that we built to demonstrate symbolic execution for JavaScript. We unveiled uh, it yesterday at the workshop, and um, it basically does exactly what I just described. So I'm going to go over a, a quick demo. And now if you can just stop breathing, stop tweeting, stop downloading so that I have internet access, that would be useful. So this is Unite. So Unite works by solving puzzles. So here I have a, a very simple uh, puzzle that takes one variable, x, uh, which is a number, so I have to declare that you know the type of the um, of the input. It's pretty trivial, right? Uh, if x is defined, it returns true; otherwise, it returns false. So I can click on run here, and if I have internet connection, I'll get the result. Yes, I have. So here you can see that the um, unite came up with two input values. So first, the, the input was x equals zero, and the output of the function was false and then uh, x if equal 1, and the output of the function was true. Now, if I, can, if I want to test my, um, my example about um, validating email, um, I, can, I can do it very easily. So I had first um, a, a trim on the email so that I removed the white space. And then I basically said, OK, if my email matches my regular expression, which was saying basically I want to have uh, at least one character, then I want to have an add symbol, then I want to have another character, then I want to have a dot, and then I have to have, again, at least one character, right? First time, first time I type um, a regular expression live, so I hope it's going to work. OK, so I have my validated email function. And now I'm going to change my uh, puzzle um, to um, called validate email. And now the input is not a number anymore. It's a string. Right? Now if I run. OK, you're still tweeting and downloading. No. So the people at the workshop yesterday can attest that this actually works. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'm going to try to load again.
Okay, no internet connection. So let me just explain what this was supposed to do. So it was supposed to show basically the same as before, but instead of x equals zero, it will have uh, shown x equal a, a, a normal string, and then x equal an email address that was composed basically of uh, space characters, so backslash t, backslash n, an add symbol, spaces, a dot, and some other spaces, right? And so, so that would have actually been a, a syntactically valid email address as far as my uh, regular expression over here uh, tells me. But it's obviously not one that is uh, valid um, um, in reality. So basically, using a tool like this, you can figure out an input for, uh, for the function or the unit you want to test that is probably different from the one you would have taught when writing a regular test case. But that is actually very interesting because such an email address could, such an, an, a wrong input could actually be the starting point of an attack to a piece of code, right? Because if you can start inputting in some weird characters in a, in a text field, for instance, God knows what, can, what you can do with it as far as, you know, code injection go, uh, uh, go, goes and, and that kind of stuff. So it's pretty disappointing that you did, oh, yes, it works. <laughs> Uh, let's let's put in the fact that it went to Ireland, to Amazon, and, and came back to India. So that's why it took some time. So, <laughs> so here you can see backslash t at backslash t dot backslash t backslash t. So, so from there you can figure out, for instance, that the email equal email dot trim is actually completely useless because you have lots of um, of spaces. And that instead of you know dot, you should probably put uh, backslash w because you only want um, word characters. Um, that's what. So, so backslash w plus backslash dot. Right. So now if I fix that and I rerun, we have time, right? So anyway, it should work. Um, so another thing that we can do with this thing that I'm not going to demo, but uh, that I encourage you to try is we can actually compare two implementations. That's what I was saying before. So let's say you're doing refactoring because you know your code is never as nice as it should be, so you're improving it. And as part as uh, doing this, you're writing an, a, a new function that's that's supposed to be functionally equivalent to the old one, just nicer. Um, here I have an example here with um, string that substring. In JavaScript, you have actually two native methods, substring. One is substring, the other one is substring. And it's actually a cool example for refactoring because uh, actually this is the kind of mistake you can make very easily because they sound the same, they're supposed to do the same, and they mostly do the same except for some parameters. So if I run that into unite, and uh, did the other example finish? No. Okay, no, any, no hope that this works, but you can try it for yourself. So the address is unite.bugbuster.com. Uh, so basically what this will show you is that with this set of parameters, there are actually inputs to the substring function that produce different uh, uh, results than the substring function. So, right. and, and you can use that with a more, more complicated piece of code. Of code, we have another example here um, with some, uh, some um, tag parsing codes two functions that are equivalent, um, the, where the tool actually shows uh, all the inputs that, where the two functions are equivalent. Uh, so Unite is actually, as I said, it's a toy, it's a playground. We want to get people used to the idea of dynamic analysis, the, of the idea of generating um, uh, inputs for, you, for your tests. And uh, in order to get yourself familiar with it, we also built a few challenges. So you can go on Unite, maybe not now because it doesn't work, but <laughs> Um, and you can actually try to guess what a secret function does. So it's the same idea as the compare mode, but it's, um, it's, um, you, you basically have to guess the implementation of the function. All right, that's it for the demo, which was a great success. Uh, <laughs> um, so beyond Unite, uh, our main product is actually called Backbuster. And what it does is integration testing. So. At the core, you have the same idea with symbolic execution, but on top of that, we also detect the UI elements on your web page. We trigger events so that we can trigger the JavaScript codes. 
And uh, then when you have text values, um, we, we use symbolic execution to figure them out. So this is a way for you to explore your application as much as possible and try to basically see if you know, your, your application behaves in, in odd ways. We also have a cool API that is timing insensitive. So if you compare that with Selenium, uh, you're going to actually write much less code. I think I still have some time. Um, so now I have a few slides explaining how this is all implemented and what are the challenges, what are the limitations. So as you can imagine, there are a few. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, how to go about tracing of constraints. So I have shown you this thing where you know when you execute the code, we analyze everything that is that is being done. And that actually requires uh, basically instrumenting every single statement of your JavaScript code. So there are two ways to implement that. One is you can use a, a JavaScript parser and you can insert hooks in the JavaScript code so that you basically uh, spy on everything that's being done. That's one way. It's, it's difficult because then you're also going to have to uh, basically re-implement a, a JavaScript virtual machine and embedded in your JavaScript code. It's sort of very tricky. Another way, which is the, the, the way we implemented our solution, is you take a JavaScript engine like uh, Rhino or JavaScript Core. In our case, we took JavaScript Core from WebKit. So JavaScript Core still has a version that is a pure JavaScript interpreter. So you have all the, um, the code that basically executes every single statement of JavaScript. You can modify that so that you can spy on the values and understand how your code works and trace the constraint. One thing that you're going to get, I think if the JavaScript, the JavaScript core developer were to look at what we did with JavaScript, uh, with JavaScript core, they'll probably start crying because, you know, we have a, a one to two orders of magnitude slowdown because, you know, obviously we're, you know, we're messing up with everything. Um, so it's going to be slow, but it's not a big deal because, you know, this is a tool that's meant to run by itself. It's not, uh, you know, uh, the JavaScript core interpreter is not going to be used live by users. So. The slowdown is, is not an issue. The other issue is the how to solve the constraints. So again, with this example with the email address, uh, I have to somehow be able to solve that equation. And it does not really look like an equation, right? It, it's code. So uh, this is actually um, uh, the most difficult part of the whole thing. Um, and in order to do that, you can use SMT solvers. So SMT stands for Satisfiable Modulo Theories. So it's a set of theories that map real-world problems, like this problem, to, uh, to basically logic formulas that can be solved. Uh, this is fairly challenging, and this is the main reason why uh, symbolic execution has not been used so much uh, until now. Uh, because actually, um, this is, this is, uh, this is, yeah, this is really very hard. And a lot, there are lots of smart people in research that are uh, improving these things um, nowadays. Um, in particular, for JavaScript, you're going to have, uh, you know, specific issues. Uh, you, you know, you have fairly, um, fairly interesting uh, string manipulating functions in JavaScript. We have regular expressions. Uh, these are very challenging because you can express very complicated things with them, and then solving that is, is difficult. So some constraints cannot be solved. So if you try and unite, you will see some things can be solved in less than a second. Others, they'll just time out. That's the reason. There are things that we, we cannot necessarily solve. But in general, for most type of programs, um, we can do a good job, and we can progress well in the program. Last problem, the path explosion problem. This is a problem that you're facing every day when you're trying to write test case. It's basically the fact that there, there is most likely an unlimited number of paths in your program, right? You're, you're writing if statements, loops, and things all over the place. And so it's, it's likely that you, you know, your program can actually work in, 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 in many, many different ways. So this problem affects symbolic execution because what we do there is we're taking this huge tree and we're trying to follow uh, one path at a time, right? So in, in a big program, it's going to take a long time. But the good news is it's going to be much faster than you doing it manually, right? So you can explore thousands and thousands of paths with these techniques, whereas uh, if you were to write test cases entirely manually, you'll probably only do a few, a few dozens if you're very, very uh, motivated. Uh, okay, that's it. I'm, um, 
I'm getting to the end of the talk. I hope um, I was able to give you, an over, give you an overview of what dynamic analysis and symbolic execution can do for you. Uh, I really encourage you to start looking into these techniques. Uh, we strongly believe that this is the future. This is what's going to help developers build all these fancy applications for, uh, for the web, uh, including Firefox OS and all these uh, very nice uh, application platform. Uh, it's not something that you should think of as a replacement to, you know, manual testing or unit testing or static analysis. It's really a, a very nice complement. Um, so you can, for instance, use JS hint so, so that, you know, you get your warnings about your code and then use Unite or Bugbuster to generate more test cases and complete the test suits that you would write manually. Uh, we currently have two products. One is Unite, which is this, uh, this playground that I just showed you. And, uh, and our main product, Bugbuster, which is currently in beta. So it's, uh, it's free to use for everyone. Um, so that's it. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Awesome. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, is there any API which we can use uh, from our application? Um, yes, but it's not documented and public yet, but it's coming. Okay. Um, so both for Unite and Bugbuster, uh, we're going to have public REST APIs so that you can use it all from the command line or build plugins for your IDEs and, um, and stuff. We have for Bugbuster, we have, a, for instance, a Jenkins plugin that is pending. Um, so that uses the API. So that can be used as an example. Okay. Uh, my second question is, in the example, validate email example you showed us, so it was generating just a couple of use, uh, test cases. So, I mean, how can we trust this, this particular system to be a more exhaustive uh, than a, a test case which is something manually prepared or through some other system? Uh, so you'll see that it will do a lot of things. So it's going to be obvious that it does uh, um, more testing. Now, uh, there is no way for us to tell you that we tested everything. Uh, the main reason being that in a, in a program that has loops and stuff, it's, it's very difficult to compute the number of paths in a program. So what we're doing is we're actually showing coverage, so uh, coverage of the statements. So that gives you an idea of, um, where is it? So let's see if it works better now. Um, Uh, yeah, so with these two things, if I highlight here, I see the, the coverage. Can you see the green that changes, right? So this gives you an idea of how good the tests were. Uh, on, you should definitely use coverage, I mean, not just with Unite, in general. Uh, that, that's, I guess, a, a common uh, that applies to everything. If you're doing testing, you need to measure the coverage. Otherwise, you're in the dark. You have no idea if you've tested 1% or 99% of your code. The mic is moving. So to your point around coverage, uh, doesn't the tool automatically give you all the paths because it's able to get to the paths? So why, why, why is there like a limitation on it not reaching all the paths? I'm still not it's able to get It's just a matter that. of time. Okay, so if you expanded the time horizon, will it give you? Uh, yes unless you have expressions that our solver cannot understand. So there are things, for instance, that are extremely difficult. Uh, I can give you an example. Um, here I have a, rep uh, a regular expression with a match, and it works right. usually just fine. If I have a regular expression with a replace, that's probably going to blow up our solver. So there are limitations, but when you have constraints that our solver can understand, and if you leave it enough time, then in principle it can explore all paths. And can this uh, tool be used also uh, for REST-based APIs and services? Uh, no, right now it's pure JavaScript. It's pure JavaScript. Yes. Okay. So if your JavaScript interacts with the REST API, then well, that will work. Uh, but if you have, typically, if you have uh, inputs that is processed on the back end, that we don't see. It's only um, it's only front end code. Or I mean, you can paste in here back end code, but if you talk to a uh, remote component that we don't see. Hi. Um, excuse me. Where, where, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, see, uh, there can be cases of uh, infinite recursion and all, right? Yes. So, uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, timeouts. Okay. Um, so, if you run for too long, we just stop. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, if you run for too long, you're in trouble, right? Uh, if you write a manual test that runs forever because you have an infinite recursion, that's a bug. So, if you have a timeout, that's an indication that something's wrong. Okay, uh, one more thing. The previous example that you showed, um, um, uh, you know, uh, there was only one k uh, path that uh, was tracked. Um, and there were two test cases, and both the test cases returned false. So, uh -huh. uh, I mean, how, how do we get to know that, uh, you know, how much of the code is actually covered? Uh, so, that's basically what I showed before. You can see for each path what is the covered code, right? Now, if um, yeah, but that gives you individual coverage of one test case, right? Sorry? That gives you a coverage of one test case. Uh, of your code, yes. Yeah. So, uh, is there any way to track down, you know, which particular, uh, you know, um, uh, lines of code were not covered at all? Um, so, there, there could be. Uh, in the web interface that is there on Unite, there is not. There is not. Uh, on Bugbuster, um, the, main, the main thing, um, it actually runs and explores for a long time, and then you, you see the aggregate coverage on a file. So if you have a JavaScript library that has 1,000 lines, and it's been running and triggering hundreds of events that were using that library, then you will see the aggregate coverage. And so then you will see the, the lines that are not covered. Um, and then you can decide if that is either things you should test uh, in another way, or if this is actually maybe dead code. Uh, we have a question upstairs. Yeah. So, uh, in addition to doing, uh, does it, is there any way for me to kind of, uh, or, or does it automatically give garbage values and try to check that? So, you know, exception cases and all that. So, for example, in this particular case, you have one valid email, uh, but emails can be of multiple formats, right? Yes. So, would it would it actually look at your regular expression and and try different versions of the valid code? Uh, no, but we have uh, a million ideas for doing that kind of things. So far, we've been focusing a lot on the exploration part of the code, and we report the bugs that pop up uh, in the form of exceptions. Uh, that we will tell you, and you know, in Bugbuster, we also report all sorts of browser issues. But yes, over time, we'd like to to add more dynamic analysis uh, checks that can, you know. Take you know, look at various aspects of your code and give you hints or tips about what's going on and what should maybe be done differently. Mm, one last question from up here: uh, Can you use this coverage information or like instrumented code to figure out dead parts in the code and hint the the, the programmers that these parts of your app are probably not being used anymore? It, um, you you can, think it's also possible? You can use that uh, to get hints about what parts of your code uh, are dead. Because if you run for a long time and, and it cannot figure out inputs, and you as a developer cannot either figure out inputs to reach these parts, then chances are that this is dead code. But it cannot tell you for sure this is dead code. Yeah, it doesn't have to. It can just hint at it. Well, the hint is you've been generating tons of tests, and this code still hasn't been uh, touched. That is the hint. Uh, it's difficult to go beyond that, uh, for sure. Oh, question here. So, um, let's say there are two functions, function one and function two, and they are modifying similar, uh, same state. And uh, uh, the order switches sometimes, and that order has a bug uh, because of AJAX or some async execution. Uh, is it possible for you to figure out that in normal case, function one is always called before function two, but in situations when function two gets called first, we'll have issues. Can you f find out those issues? Um, so there are actually quite a few papers that have been published that look at timing issues. Um, and what they do is they will actually try to figure out the timing dependencies the very, the, uh, between the various parts of the code, and then influence these timing dependencies to trigger bugs. We don't do that. This is something we could potentially do someday. Um, if there is a hundred of us that of you that want to help us do that, please uh, um, come and join us. Uh, there is quite a bit of work there. Um, 
but yes, these are very interesting things, especially when you run the, the so this is just for unit testing. In Bugbuster, we run the full uh, browser thing. And yes, there are lots of AJAX requests uh, uh, going on. And we've had cases, uh, uh, especially with one customer, where uh, there was one bug uh, that was due to timing issues, and the bug will pop up uh, with Bugbuster sometimes, and sometimes it, it wasn't, because we don't control the timing. So then we have the same issue as a normal user or tester. If the latency of the network changes, then you get a different result. But yes, this is a very interesting direction for future work. <laughs> Okay, uh, the puzzle function, uh, it'll take primitive objects only, is it? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, because, uh, you know, um, many cases uh, our functions might have uh, an actual object. So right. So how do you test those cases? So, so this is a very simplified API. Yeah, yeah. Um, currently, we do not uh, support, so basically this is fuzzing uh, values, right? It's, it's actually fuzzing in a, in a smart way because it's trying to solve equations to yep. find the values. Yep. We can fuzz only uh, primitive types, yeah, that's okay. but we can uh, go into an object to to tell the tool that this part of the object, yeah, yeah. which is of a primitive type, should be fuzzed. Yeah, so, uh, um, this is not exposed in, in, in this tool yet, but it's, okay. it, 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 it's actually there. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, thank you, Olivier. Uh, round of applause, guys. Thank you. That's awesome.